I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Anna Keese from Johns Hopkins joining us. And Dr. Keese is going to be talking about contouring level six and seven lymph nodes, as well as relevant OARs in those areas. And then we'll have a chance to review some cases uh, to learn. So Dr. Keese, thanks for taking the time today and we're glad to have you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me and thanks for accommodating the time change. If you hear any little noises in the background, it's my three boys not quite asleep. <laughs> um, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this. So I was going to start with the level six lymph nodes and sort of do an introduction and then run through the contouring. I'm going to go back and forth between the PowerPoint and the RTOG contouring head and neck atlas, which does a nice job with six level six and seven nodes and then go to level seven nodes um, and their contouring and then discuss the relevant OERs. And then we'll, I think, turn the screen over to you or I can do it, whichever, for the case-based learning. So the level six nodes um, are the prelaryngeal and paratracheal nodes in the inferior neck. Um, um, these, uh, these level six and level seven are sort of more rare involved lymph nodes for various head and neck cancers, but um, particularly for level six, they're very likely to be involved and are in fact the most likely lymph nodes to be involved for thyroid cancer. So that's why I said the disease sites where you include level six is thyroid, thyroid, thyroid. So um, there's also um, spread to level six for in some advanced larynx cancers, particularly those with subglottic spread or with significant anterior commissure involvement or transglottic involvement. And then if you have very advanced, um, some oral cavity cases, so like advanced floor of mouth cases or lower lip cases or um, advanced hypopharynx cases that extend to the apex. But the majority of cases are, th are thyroid and larynx with subglottic extension. And then in general, for most um, standard oropharynx, hypopharynx, larynx, salivary, and oral cavity cases, you don't actually need to include level six. Um, so we'll go through the boundaries and then go through the atlas. And then I'm going to do uh, just show some slides from a thyroid case that um, is actually completing treatment right now. So um, this is from the RTOG Atlas manuscript and it's the level six lymph node contouring boundaries, cranial, caudal, anterior, posterior, lateral, and medial. And then it's split between level 6A and level 6B. Level 6A is very anterior and central and those are the anterior jugular nodes and level 6B is really right in front of the larynx and trachea um, and um, also directly behind uh, in the tracheoesophageal groove, so the paratracheal nodes. And, you know, this illustration is not great for these, this level, but this is level 6A, and this, uh, this is the trachea here, anterior and posterior are um, level 6B. And um, I'm going to go ahead and um, stop sharing this one and go over to the atlas is great hold on here we go okay can you see that yeah that looks great okay. so down 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 um so these um i'll just instead of going through the details of the table, I think it's easier to visualize here. So the level six nodes are this um, light purple for 6A and the dark purple for 6B. And um, both of them, the inferior extent is the manubrium. So you can see they pop into view right here above the manubrium. And the 6A nodes are anterior to the strap muscles and in between the sternocleidomastoid muscles. So here's the right sternocleidomastoid, left sternocleidomastoid, and the right strap and left strap. And so this little square in between all those is the 6A. And the 6B is sort of anything sort of from that plane of the anterior strap backwards, excluding the esophagus, but around the entire trachea and esophagus, but excluding the esophagus. So, and in between the common carotids. So here's the 
left carotid and right carotid, and you can drag those up and down, and the level six is medial to the carotids. So going up, the um, superior extent is again staying medial to the carotids and behind the thyroid gland in the TE group for 6B, and then anterior to the strap muscles for 6A. The superior extent is the, um, I believe it's the cricoid um, for 6B, and then the hyoid um, or submandibular glands, whichever comes first for 6A. So here's the submandibular glands, it stops there. And then depending on the angle of the neck, if the hyoid dips lower than the submandibular glands, then it can extend, uh, it can stop at the hyoid, whichever is lower. Um, let me just double check um, for the 6Bs. The cranial extent is actually the caudal edge of the thyroid cartilage, not the cricoid. So let me go back to other guys are still viewing this one, right? So here, it's the thyroid cartilage coming into view here that's supposed to be the superior extent of six. six. So um, any questions about where those levels are located? So 6B is much more likely to be involved in thyroid cancer than 6A. 6B is um, the TE group nodes are classic for echelon drainage for thyroid cancer. Um, so I had a patient, let me stop sharing and go back to my, presentation. All right, are you guys seeing the PowerPoint again? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a case of a patient that's on treatment right now, finished actually today, I believe. And he was, uh, he's a 64-year-old, otherwise healthy gentleman who presented with a central neck mass. FNA showed, pap showed papillary thyroid cancer, and his initial staging CTs showed extra thyroid, a very large thyroid cancer with extra thyroid extension and extensive involvement of the cervical and mediastinal lymph nodes and inde indeterminate small lung nodules. So he underwent surgical resection, a th total thyroidectomy, bilateral neck dissection, and then a pretty extensive mediastinal node dissection requiring a median sternotomy. And the surgical pathology showed the papillary thyroid cancer with tall cell and columnar cell variants, which are high-risk variants and multiple positive margins. So we recommended adjuvant external beam radiation since his local regional disease was much more advanced than any distant metastases, which were indeterminate at that time. And um, he actually recovered from surgery beautifully. He was swallowing by mouth, um, did not have um, uh, any, uh, he didn't have a trach in. He was breathing and swallowing normally and did very well. This is his initial staging scan. So this is um, a level 6A node. This is a level 6B node. And then here's his very bulky um, mediastinal adenopathy. So all of that was removed surgically, and we had pretty large fields to cover in this gentleman. Um, he actually had level two nodes involved as well. Um, on the left, we didn't include the right level two because we wanted to give him, um, or 1B, we didn't want to give him a serious xerostomia. Going down further in the neck, he had positive margins here in the left thyroid bed and um, left level six nodes. and um, and then also positive margins as you go down into the upper paratracheal thoracic nodes. So we gave 66 gray to those areas and two gray fractions, and then 5940 to the rest of the um, upper mediastinal nodes and sort of left levels two through six and right levels, um, I believe it was three through six. Um, so, uh, you can see it ends up being quite large fields. Um, and Dr. Keese, can you talk a little bit about how you drew your, your volume, specifically the GTV and the CTV? Well, there was not actually residual gross disease left, um, except for this little node that um, was not resected. Everything else was resected. So, this... Um, I 
tend to, and most of my colleagues tend to draw the PTVs directly rather than doing CTVs with expansion um, because in the head and neck when you do um, routine expansions like expand by five millimeters on all sides that you know you end up um, going more into normal tissues than you would um, because your usual expansions would be you know, three millimeters here, four millimeters there, five millimeters there. For, so for most head and neck cases, I go directly to drawing PTVs. I don't know how many of the other attendings who presented did said the same thing, but. Um, I, I think for thyroid, um, my attending tells me it's a little bit like the Wild West. Oh yeah, for thyroid, you, it's, uh, there's no rules. I mean, I've written a couple mm -hmm. papers on sort of when to give radiation, but how to give radiation is, you know, it's very um, user dependent. And, you know, if you're really conservative, you give radiation bilateral levels two through six in the upper mediastinum um, in all cases. But because these patients often have lung metastases and competing risks um, and also have a generally good quality of life, you have to balance all of those considerations. So um, for this case, you know, he did have extensive bilateral disease. So I um, basically, Matt, I fused, I don't have the fused images here, but I fused those pre-op images, um, the CT to his um, simulation CT. And I talked to the surgeon about the areas that he was most concerned for positive margins. And so they directly told me, you know, we had to shave the disease off of the left trachea here, and we had to shave the disease off the recurrent laryngeal nerve, and then we had to shave the disease off of the trachea in the upper thorax, and they also shaved the disease off some of the great vessels. <laughs> so in every area where they said they had to shave disease off, I contoured 66 gray in those areas. And then the 5940, I just kept kind of tight to where the actual nodal regions are um, without a significant um, expansion for PTV, maybe five millimeters into the um, muscle for the sternocleidomastoid and the deep neck muscles. Um, I um, don't tend to give five millimeters of margin into the pharynx just to avoid um, toxicities. And, um, you know, I kept it pretty tight on the lungs, too, because we were going so deep into the mediastinum because he had subcarinal nodes. Actually, I just doesn't show every slice, but he had subcarinal nodes and the anterior mediastinal nodes. So the amount of lung exposure was actually significant for him. Um, mm -hmm. questions? Yeah, I think those are some good points, uh, especially in patients with extensive disease. Not only do you want to get the pre-op imaging, but if you can, try to have a discussion with the surgeon mm -hmm. they can tell you things that may not be evident on the imaging. Yeah, especially in head and neck cancer, there's a lot of places where you know, a positive margin on the path report actually is not an area of concern. So like um, anteriorly by the strap muscles, it's pretty easy for them to take another additional margin specimen and clear the strap muscles. It's also easy to go back and re resect recurrent disease in that area. But if they have, um, if they're peeling disease off the trachea or um, off the recurrent laryngeal nerve, they almost always want me to boost there. So the surgeons um, generally have very specific um, high risk areas that they're concerned about, especially in thyroid cancer. Um, Are there any other questions uh, about thyroid cancer while we're on this uh, topic? Feel free to, to type or you can unmute yourself and speak. I will say um, my standard thyroid fields don't go all the way to the subcarinal area. My standard <laughs> thyroid fields will kind of stop at the arch of the aorta. Um, and, um, but they do kind of cover the thoracic inlet. Um, so it doesn't just stop at the manubrium always, it's sometimes a little bit more inferior. As much as there is a standard. <laughs> <laughs> And for a well lateralized case, I'll actually do unilateral sometimes for thyroid cases, um, which there's no textbook that's going to say to do that, but it really does help with toxicity. Okay, great. Well, uh, I guess we can move on.
Okay, so um, level seven lymph nodes include the retropharyngeal and retrostyloid nodes. These, I always remember in my mind, Nancy Lee, I trained at Memorial Sloan Kettering, telling me that the reason these ones matter is because it's a terrible place to fail. So if you do radiation and you exclude this area and the patient has a recurrence in the retropharyngeal or retrostyloid space, then re-irradiation is very difficult because it's close to the brainstem and spinal cord and surgical resection is usually not possible. Recurrence in this area is almost always unresectable and re-irradiation is challenging. So that is why, really why they matter um, uh, most importantly. Um, the retropharyngeal nodes are um, very, the first echelon drainage for nasopharynx cancers. So that is the classic cancer that um, has gross disease in the retropharyngeal nodes. And other pharyngeal sites, hypopharynx and oropharynx, especially posterior cases of those, have frequent retropharyngeal nodal involvement. Larynx, salivary, and oral cavity cancers do not tend to go to the retropharyngeal nodes. Um, and unless they're very advanced, and especially you have bulky level two nodes, in any case of head and neck cancer, if there's bulky level two nodes, you may want to consider covering level seven in case there's um, sort of retrograde flow superiorly. So um, again, this is from the RTOG nodal atlas. Uh, level 7A nodes are retropharyngeal and level, seven, level 7B are retrostyloid. And this image, again, is not very good for this nodal setting. It's just this little green dot right there. <laughs> um, but we'll go over to the atlas. Um, and the um, basically level 7B is above level 2 and um, level 7A is um, sort of tucked behind the pharyngeal constrictors on the sides, and they usually just uh, contour the lateral retropharyngeal nodes. There is very rare to have involvement of the midline or medial retropharyngeal nodes. So um, let's go over to the atlas again. and go up superiorly. So it's level 1B, level 2, and then here's the retropharyngeal nodes. This is level, hold on, let me move this over. All right, so this is level 7A here, so the retropharyngeal, and as you can, these are the pharyngeal constrictors here, and then the prevertebral muscles, and there's a little fat space tucked in between those, um, that is medial to the carotid here, and that is the tiny little retropharyngeal space. So you're, on the other side, you can see the carotid. Can you guys see my cursor? Yep, yep. So carotid artery here, um, pharyngeal constrictor, prevertebral muscle, and it's this fat space in here on the other side. So the inferior extent of it, this is something that used to trip me up a lot as a resident, is um, the hyoid. So as soon as you see that hyoid come into view, you can stop contouring, uh, dipping in. And actually, that's really important because um, the toxicity associated with treating um, below that in this area of the sort of hypopharynx and entering the cricopharyngeus, especially if, if you're still dipping in to cover that and you don't need to, you're causing um, risk of dysphagia. So um, once you get, once you see the hyoid, you can, um, whoops, sorry, wrong way. Still the wrong way. Okay. Um, once you see the hyoid, you can stop contouring for the retropharyngeal. So they go from the hyoid all the way up to um, C1. And here's the dens, here's C1, and that's the dens of C2 there. So, um, and then the retrostyloid, I believe, is this red one here, 7B. And so here's the styloid process. The easiest way to find the styloid process is to scroll up and down and see the bone density go forward and disappear. Because sometimes if you have really bright contrast on the carotid artery, 
um, it's so close to it that um, it's sometimes easy to confuse the styling process for the carotid artery. So if you scroll up and down, the, the styling process connects up with the mastoid and then disappears, whereas the carotid continues on. So um, the retrostyloid is behind the styloid process and basically right above um, level two. So this level, green is level two. And if you go up um, to the skull, it goes all the way up to the skull base for a retrostyloid. And um, the cases where you really need to cover retrostyloid include nasopharynx is standard. And then it, again, bulky level two cases um, you, and, and also other cases that include RP nodes, you also want to include retrostyloid. Um, again, it's kind of the retrograde flow from level two that you um, want to cover. And um, any questions about those? So this, this would be the sort of medial retropharyngeal space, and that is not covered routinely as a nodal space, although for nasopharyngeal cases, you're covering the entire nasopharynx anyway, so they're treated. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop to share on that. Any questions, Ben or anyone? These are tricky ones, the level six and le level seven. So I'm gonna go back and share a patient who actually is also on treatment right now. Um, all right, are you seeing the PowerPoint again? Yep. Okay. So this is a case a uh, patient with nasopharyngeal cancer and um, he presented with a left neck, neck mass and nasal congestion symptoms, otherwise very healthy and fine needle aspirate showed um, EBV. He was Caucasian too. He didn't um, have a history of uh, family living in or having moved from Asia. The, the fine needle aspirate of the neck and um, the nasopharyngeal mass both showed um, EBV positive uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. And his CT showed a nasopharyngeal mass um, that was limited to the nasopharynx with possible mild peripharyngeal extension and then extensive lymphadenopathy, bilateral retropharyngeal, bilateral level two, bilateral level three, and bilateral level four, and no lung nodules. So he was treated with induction chemotherapy followed by definitive concurrent chemoradiation. And these are some of his initial staging CT images. So this is the nasopharyngeal mass here. It really filled most of the nasopharynx. And then here's the right retropharyngeal node, not very enhancing, but you can see the discrepancy. And then here's the left retropharyngeal node here. So you can see the carotid arteries are here. And just medial to that, there's supposed to be like a fat space and peripharyngeal space, and that whole area is filled with the nodal mass on both sides. There's also, you can see a left level four node here and a right level four node there. And then a left level two conglomerate here. And then this node was kind of indeterminate because it had a fatty hilum, but a right level two node there. So he had extensive lymphadenopathy. Um, he had a great response to induction, but his fields are still, were still quite large um, because of his initial extent of disease. So um, this is some screenshots from his case. So um, I'm sorry, I don't have like all the GTVs and PTVs on here. This is mostly the, G, the PTV70 is in light blue crosshatch and PTV61 um, is in purple. And then his whole neck was high risk, so he didn't have a low risk volume. <laughs> um, so um, the, um, the disease did not um, extend into the skull base or superiorly. So I covered sort of part of the sphenoid sinus, but not the entire sphenoid sinus. That is something that is kind of tricky in nasopharynx cancer, because um, if you cover the entire sphenoid sinus, you end up overdosing the pituitary and also getting quite close to the optic nerves and chiasm. So in his case, you know, it was pretty well confined 
in to the to the nasopharynx and I felt comfortable um, stopping the contours partway up the sphenoid sinus. So here's the sphenoid sinus here. You do always want to cover the posterior portion of the maxillary sinus mostly because you want to catch um, the pterygopalatine fossa here for potential perineural spread or direct extension into the posterior nasal cavity here. And you have to include the entire peripharyngeal space and then at least the um, anterior portion of the clivus. Um, and then here, this is lower sort of um, border between the nasopharynx and oropharynx and um, the level two nodes and extending back to include level four as well um, and five. So I covered um, levels 1B through 5 bilaterally plus retropharyngeal and retrostyloid. So 1B through 5 bilaterally and bilateral level 7s. Um, and then here are sort of the areas of the retropharyngeal nodal involvement and level 2 nodes. Um, so his 70 gray field is quite large. Um, and then down here, getting into level 1B, still covering level 5. Um, so 1B, um, I believe it's still level 2 here and 5. And then down here, I separate off to push off the larynx. So you can see the, the isodose curves pushing. This is the cricopharyngeus really outlined here and the larynx to try to reduce dysphagia risk. So the, and because the retropharyngeal nodes end here, I felt comfortable pushing the dose off pretty hard from the larynx and cricopharyngeus, and that helped a lot. Um, he got through treatment without a feeding tube and did quite well, actually. Um, but you know, still, I covered very generously um, level five and even into some of the superclav because of his extent of nodal involvement, and then all the way down um, inferiorly to. Um, just above the manubrium. So huge fields on this case as well. So um, any questions about this nasopharynx case or nasopharynx in general? Uh, Rochelle, I wanted to ask if it was common for you to see cases like this when you were training in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. Like for nasopharynx? Yeah, we see them a lot. Like with bulky nodes and like with bilateral nodal involvement like multi multi-level involvement um so nasopharynx is really a challenging are really is really a challenging case to manage in the philippines because we also have like since because they're bulky now we have or if they're not bulky just like a lot of nodes on the neck um we have a a lot of um, concern with toxicity and with meeting constraints of OARs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they get bad dry mouth because like for him, it's bilateral 1B. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, because this nasopharynx, it's really hard to spare their parotids too. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm worried about his, you know, dental health and his mm -hmm. diet long-term. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rochelle. Right. Okay, perfect segue. Yeah, so, you know, I really just focused on the OERs and the low neck by level six. Um, I think probably other um, folks have talked a lot about the level two OERs. One thing, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll comment on that a little bit in a second, but particularly when you're covering level six, um, the thyroid, larynx, and esophagus or cricopharyngeus are at risk. Usually you're doing thyroid cancer cases, so the thyroid has already been removed and the endocrinologist is managing um, you know, what the target TSH level is based on the level of suppression that's desired to reduce risk of thyroid cancer recurrence. So um, it's more relevant if the thyroid is intact, like for a larynx case or um, an advanced oral cavity or hypopharynx case. But, um, you know, for larynx cancer, particularly, the thyroid is very at risk for hypothyroidism. And, um, you know, uh, if the mean dose is less than 45, that reduces the risk of that. The larynx um, is 
one of the most critical structures in the head and neck, not just for um, voice, but for dysphagia um, in the cricopharyngeus, which is the esophageal inlet right behind there um, and cervical esophagus. So the doses to these structures are very associated with late dysphagia and also with acute toxicities um, such as um, you know, odynophagia and edema, occasionally at respiratory distress, but really more um, issues around nutrition, swallowing, and aspiration risk. So um, the dose constraints for the larynx are kind of a moving target, to be completely honest. So, you know, you'd like to get the mean less than 40 gray, which, you know, you can obtain when you're doing a nasopharynx case, like that last one, but if you're targeting the larynx or thyroid or any other target, like the hypopharynx, it's very hard to achieve a mean dose of less than 40 gray. One thing I didn't mention that I meant to mention um, back here is, um, I don't have it on here, but the level six nodes, they stop at the inferior thyroid cartilage. So um, one common mistake is to just, for a thyroid case, include the entire larynx. But if the larynx was not involved directly through direct extension and you're just trying to cover level six, you can spare the area of the arytenoid and the glottis, and that will help a lot. Um, and you can spare the cricopharyngeus. Um, so that's um, one sort of tip to help with dysphagia risks. Sorry. Um, did this? Here we go. Um, but um, if you can get the larynx mean greater less than 40 and the cricopharyngeus mean less than 50. And again, esophage esophagus risk is for esophagitis acutely and for esophageal stenosis um, in late effects. And um, you try to avoid circumferential involvement of the, cir of the cervical esophagus. You know, when you contra the entire esophagus, there's different dose constraints, V50 less than 40% or V70 less than 20%. But I think a main trick is if you do have to have a 66 or 70 gray field involving the cervical esophagus, you try not to have that high, high dose field include the entire circumferential um, volume so that you're um, keeping potentially at least part of the wall of the esophagus more flexible. And, um, and then of course, using swallow therapy consultation to teach swallowing exercises is really key for preventing dysphagia and stenosis in these patients. Um, and then in the retropharyngeal area, um, you know, when you're treating retropharyngeal and retrostyloid nodes, the parotids are a concern because um, it's very hard to um, achieve, you know, your mean of 26 gray or other target constraint targets for um, the bilateral parotid glands when you're treating the bilateral retropharyngeal nodes and retrostyloid. Other um, organs at risk are the um, cochlea and the inner ear structures and um, it's hard for nasopharyngeal cancer to achieve your usual dose constraint for other head and neck cancers, which might be max of 45 or 50 gray, to really minimize risk of late hearing loss um, or of middle ear dysfunction, like chronic middle ear effusions. Um, but um, if you can't achieve a max of 45 or 50, I think achieving a max of 55 and a mean of less than 45 it's great to um, or trying to just at least spare one side preferentially if the disease is off to one side um, so those are the other concerns about treating the upper neck and then of course your brain stem is uh, and spinal cord constraints which are usually um, able to meet um, unless there's base of skull involvement We do have one question. Mm -hmm. um, this is regarding uh, advanced nasopharynx cancer cases. Um, and I, this may be a topic of, of uh, debate, but it, it's regarding um, the 60 gray target. Um, for, do, do we, uh, I guess, 
Hmm. When do we think about not covering the entire sphenoid sinus? Because I, I think a lot of guidelines say to cover the sphenoid sinus, and I think that's what we've been talking about yeah. in most of our other lectures. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would say if there's, um, if there's base of skull involvement, like bony erosion um, or cranial neuropathies, then, you know, you really need to cover it. Um, but, um, you know, the sphenoid sinus anatomy also is very uh, highly variable. So some, you know, the size of the sphenoid sinus and the amount of aeration of the bone and um, the sort of uh, proximity to the optic nerves um, changes, you know, patient to patient. So um, for that example, I showed that patient had a large sphenoid sinus. And if I had covered the whole thing, I would have definitely overdose of pituitary and I was already you know a centimeter and a half away from the tumor that had no bony erosion so um, I think if you sort of put all the pieces together he had no cranial neuropathies um, I I had felt that it was uh, okay to only treat you know two-thirds of the sphenoid sinus and you can drop the dose too so sometimes instead of sticking with 60 gray you'll treat the whole sphenoid but drop the dose to um, 45 or something to try to minimize the risk of, um, of hypopituitarism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are great points. So for uh, the, the resident that asked that question, I would say in general, you want to think about covering the entire sphenoid sinus and look, but look at the patient and see if it's possible. Um, and um, maybe based on their anatomy if it, and also based on the, the tumor risk, it involves a little bit of clinical judgment and decide, um, does it make sense to, to do a 60 gray all the way? Um, and I think a lot of cases it will, but you might have some cases where um, you have to be a little bit creative. And I think I've seen some cases where maybe we, we will cover all of it, but will lower the dose a little bit at the top where it's, it's approaching the OERs. Or like Dr. Keese mentioned, um, if you feel safe enough based on the particular disease characteristics, um, you could exclude some of the, that superior portion. Yeah, and the main thing is just to check those hormone levels in follow-up. So, um, you know, always the TSH, but then if you really give a very high dose to the pituitary, you can do, we do sometimes a whole pituitary panel if we really gave a high dose to the pituitary where we um, checking the FSH or LH as well, or um, the, um, I always have to look up which one, there's like five that we check. Um, so it's rare, it's rare for like the adrenocorticostimulant stimulating hormone to be involved, but, um, you know, TSH is usually first, thyroid stimulating hormone. Mm -hmm. Great. And uh, the resident says, um, thank you very much. And um, sometimes we will compromise, like, uh, like uh, Dr. Kisa said. Um, and um, we may just give a slightly lower dose to those areas to spur the OERs. Great, you very good, good question. <laughs> Sorry, what did you say, Dr. Keith? Um, I stopped sharing my screen. I didn't know if you wanted to run the screen for the other cases or... Um, um, perhaps if you share your screen, are you able to log on okay? Yeah, I, I'm logged on. Okay, so. that way you can scroll through it, but I'll, I can help tell you where to click. <laughs> I haven't looked at them yet, so we'll okay, great. go through it together then. Great. So um, guys, for this next part, it's going to be, I'm going to try to make this very interactive. So if you're able to on, on your computers or on your phones, have your chat box ready. What we're going to do right now is, is kind of a review. So we've talked about the lymph node stations one through seven at this point. And we've talked about what 
kinds of cases you should consider covering them, um, both uh, with an intermediate dose or with an elective dose. So let's start with um, HN1 oropharynx, if you can double click this. So this case is a T3N0. Um, you can click structures on the left, uh, more left. Yeah, great. And then click the eyeball on the very top, uh, just above your mouse. Yeah. So we'll hide all the structures. Click it one more time. Great. And then if you click notes on the far right, you can see a description of the case. year old T3N0 retromolar trigone had no carcinoma. So it must be his minor salivary gland. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Excuse so, biopsy. All right. So, residents, for this case, um, we'll scroll through it. And what I would like each of you to do is discuss amongst yourself if you're at a conference room right now or if you're at your own computer, think to yourself. And then I would like you to just try typing in an answer. Well, which lymph nodes would you consider covering for um, your intermediate risk CTV? And then your elective nodes. Um, and uh, this way, you know, when we do the final assessment, you'll see a new case. And we'll, we, one of the most important things is making sure that you're choosing the right nodes to cover. So um, maybe Dr. Keese, we can point out where, where we see the GTV and then if we see any involved uh, lymph nodes. So, um, so there's a little bit of, I mean, there's definitely, you know, an enlargement in the left oral cavity here. Um, they said it was in the left retromolar trigone area, which would be in this area. Um, but it does look like it might be extending towards the tonsil area um, and potentially into the peripharyngeal. It's hard to tell without an exam. Um, and then these nodes look a little bit asymmetric, um, but may not meet size criteria in level two there. Um, and then I don't see any clearly enlarged level 1B or 1A nodes. Okay. I guess in this case, uh, since it's labeled T3N0, we'll, we'll go with the, the benefit of the doubt that there was an exam and it was felt that no um, nodes were involved. Here, whether the pterygoids involved, um, you know, if it's T3, then that would mean that it's not involved. But, um, Left two through four, I would say. Um, and I would also include the retropharyngeal nodes since it's a bulky or pharynx case. Um, so I would go up to sort of the high two or for level sevens. Um, since there's no um, lateralized lymph node involvement, I don't think I would include the level fives. And I think um, all of this would be intermediate risk CTV. Um, if I wanted to get a little bit cute, maybe I would make um, 4A intermediate risk and 4B more like an elective um, uh, dose. And then uh, I would do elective on the um, right two through four as well. So that is my guess. Do you want me to respond? Yeah, or? sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, we have um, 
There's a group of 10 residents in the conference room right now at Jose Reyes uh, Memorial Cancer Center. Okay. And they have written intermediate risk CTV two to four. Okay. So um, if it is like a true oropharynx cancer, um, I would agree with that. If it was truly oropharynx T3 and zero, like squamous cell carcinoma, HPV related or non HPV related. I would even consider if it was just tonsillar and you have to do an exam to figure this out, but if it was if confined to the tonsil fossa of not treating the contralateral neck for um, T3 is stretching it a little bit, but um, you know, if it's well lateralized T3 and zero, you could consider just doing unilateral neck. Um, and um, it's going to be hard to spare the submandibular gland, even if you don't specifically target level 1B because of the proximity of the primary tumor. So, you know, you, you, know, you do level 2 through 4 because it's N0, but looking at this, there's a little bit of asymmetry. So what I would probably end up doing is giving those sort of asymmetric nodes 66 gray and then covering level 1B just in case those are positive, um, if it was a, like a T3 N0 tonsil. Um, but um, in general for N0, I agree for oropharynx two through four is usually accurate. If it's truly a um, minor salivary gland adenocarcinoma, I would do a totally different approach with surgical management followed by treatment to the unilateral, if it was retromolar trigone, unilateral level um, 1B to four, and um, because oral cavity, you have to cover 1B and retromolar trigone would be part of the oral cavity. Um, but, you know, I think uh, this case kind of, uh, you know, um, can be interpreted either way. <laughs> we can learn lessons for oral <laughs> and oral cavity. <laughs> okay, great, great. Um, now click to back to patients and we'll do the next case. Um, so if you, uh, on the far left, top right, or uh, top left, sorry. Yeah, and then uh, we can do HN2. This is the nasopharynx T2 and 3. Structures on or off? Uh, we can turn them off. We had an exercise where um, uh, multiple people tried contouring the same structure, and we can look at some of the variation. I think I turned okay. the CT off. Okay, now I need to turn the structures off. There we go. Oh Great. my goodness, this is a advanced. <laughs> yeah, wow. so let's click uh, notes on the far right. Mm -hmm. All right, one year history left neck mass, epistaxis, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, non keratinizing type, T2N3N0. M zero. Um, all right. So here's a nasopharyngeal tumor here, possibly with the RP node there. It's a little bit indistinct. Seems like the nasopharyngeal tumor is extending down towards the soft palate along the lateral pharyngeal wall here. And then ends by the oropharynx and very bulky matted lymphadenopathy in levels two and five. And not seeing, oh, there's a level three node. So two, three, and five all matted together probable retropharyngeal as well. And then, you know, there's your styloid process. It's hard to tell right here whether there's involvement into the skull base. Let me see, can we change to bone? Here we go. Oh, fancy, okay. <laughs> That's not the best bone window, but um, I don't see any definite bone invasion. Let me see if I can get that back to Nick. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so T2N3 would imply parapharyngeal, T2 is parapharyngeal spread, and N3 for the bulky lymphadenopathy. On the right side, I don't, I see a preserved fat space here on the right RP, so I don't think there's any gross disease. There's this one little node there, or is that, that might just be the deep, no, that's a little node there. That one's a little bit uh, rounded. It's, um, that, that one's potentially suspicious. Um, let's say, uh, was that a right level two? Yeah, right level two. Just be between the parotid and submandibular gland, rock in a hard place. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, so this is a this is a tricky case. Um, feel free to type uh, what you think. Okay, um, so we have um, one group of residents. Um, or some residents have said high risk CTV uh, levels 1B to 5 and boost the gross nodes to 66 or 70 gray. Um, and then can you specify the laterality for your CTV volumes? They say uh, bilateral. You want me to give my take on it? Yeah, let's uh, sure. let's see. Um, so yeah, like really huge volumes on the left. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely one beta five. I would extend like even to the sort of deep cervical space here, which is not level five. It's like because the you know there's expansion beyond the actual traditional nodal level into the deep cervical space here. So, I mean, I would be hugging the vertebral body all the way back. Um, and then definitely covering level 1B in here, RP nodes all the way up, um, and retrostyloid all the way up. Um, and on the right though, you know, with just that one sort of borderline node, I think, um, you could, if depending on how you're feeling that day, do two through five. Um, I would always include the RPs on the contralateral and the level five contralateral, but sometimes we do spare one B if there's not contralateral um, definite lymphadenopathy, just to try again to reduce the risk of xerostomia. So I think in this case, I would probably do a huge 1B to 5 on the left and a 2 to 5 on the right and try to spare this right submandibular gland. But it's not wrong to do bilateral 1B to 5 in a case this extensive. And there's a question, would you recommend induction chemotherapy? Yes. Um, so there's, um, oh, I forget the first author on it, a paper in the New England Journal last year showing the induction cisplatin gemcitabine regimen had um, survival benefit um, for EBV-related nasopharyngeal cancers. Great. So that's, yeah, our awesome. standard, that's our standard of care now. It's nine, it's nine weeks, uh, I think it's three cycles every three weeks of induction, followed by concurrent chemoradiation with either we use various concurrent regimens depending on how they did during induction. So sometimes we'll do the bolus cyst, sometimes weekly cyst, sometimes weekly carbotaxol. But mm -hmm. And the weekly yeah. is um, a lower dose each time, so it's uh, more tolerable. Yeah. Sorry, Rochelle, did you have something to say? Oh, yeah. I would like just to add, like, so this is quite common in the Philippines to see them advance because they try to hold off treatment because just because of like financial issues and also logistical issues like there might not be there might be far from the hospital and also we have like this 
limitations in diagnostic that so we always have that gray line like oh should we assume that the tumor is extending because this is only the CT available to us and we couldn't confirm by MR just because the patient can't afford it so there yeah, I think it's would you say it's safe to assume like you would extend your your volumes just to cover for uncertainty Oh, like to include 1B or to include mm -hmm. more um, area in your um, sort mm -hmm. of the, like the CTV, entire CTV, yeah. Um, you know, CT is definitely has variable sensitivity for nasopharyngeal cancer. Like, you know, it's it's hard to pull out your border here. I would definitely be wider on this margin because of that. Mm -hmm. um, but um, CT is pretty good for level one and two nodes. So, you know, I would guess if you had a PET or a scan, you know, that that would show some mild level of activity and still be indeterminate. Um, but um, I think um, in the setting of uncertainty, it is always, I think, fair to go bigger because um, the toxicity risks while it's serious um, is certainly lower than the risks associated with a recurrent cancer in the head and neck. So um, I think, um, you know, again, whether to cover the entire sphenoid sinus, you can see here in this case, so here's nasopharynx and here's sphenoid, but there's like actually um, a septum between the different parts of the sphenoid in this case. And then the sphenoid connects with the nasal cavity. It's like, it's so different for every patient and it goes, all the way up, uh, it's aerated all the way superiorly to like anterior to, um, I, it's hard to tell here, but I think mm -hmm. there's and, a very, and then it goes even superior to that, like near the hypothalamus. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you covered the entire sphenoid sinus in that case, you would definitely get significant dose to the hypothalamus and pituitary. But, um, you know, in this case, with the with the advanced stage of the tumor, I think you know you'd have to definitely cover this whole area in your um, mm -hmm. sixty gray, and then maybe drop to sixty gray on one side here, and then potentially keep sixty gray on one side and try to drop to fifty four here in front of the hypo in front of the pituitary. You know, it's mm -hmm. um there is a lot of uncertainty without advance without other imaging. Mm -hmm. there, and that leads to the, the question, what dose would you give after induction chemotherapy? So um, I usually, it's, so we're actually trying to write a paper now about like adjusting, it's at, at Hopkins, we have a pneumatic oncologist, Tangy Sievert, and he's an expert in induction because he came from Chicago where they do a lot of induction chemotherapy. So I'm learning now from him a lot about how to adjust your volumes in the setting of induction. And um, we're kind of trying to write a opinion piece about it. But, um, you know, the standard answer is to, to cover everything as if it were the initial volumes. Um, so to basically do a pre-induction simulation and give, you know, uh, 70 gray to the initial gross area and then, 61 to 63 to your intermediate risk and you know around 54 or 56 to your low risk but what i do in practice is i do pre-induction and post-induction sim and i will shrink the volumes um, to um, adjust for the response um, but still make sure to cover at least in the intermediate risk field um, all of the initially intermediate risk areas. So the, basically the 63 doesn't change much um, in response to the induction, but like the 70 will be a little tighter, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a clear I answer. Think that there's, I think that there's, you know, good, I haven't, I'm not super up to date on all of the literature for nasopharynx right now, um, especially from Asia, because there's so many more cases of EBV related there. Um, I think that a lot of the papers do a range um, of GTV doses. It's not always 70, you know, sometimes it's 66 or other um, 
slightly lower doses for the high dose area. Um, mm -hmm. And um, we're, we we're coming up on, on the hour, but there's one more question that's relevant to the current landscape. And it's, uh, they're curious, how did COVID-19 affect your management of head and neck cancer patients, in, specifically in terms of dose fractionation? Did you adopt a hypofractionated regimen? No, we kept it the same. We just, um, we, um, you know, wear an N95 mask when we do scope exams. We do scope exams less frequently because there's aerosolization risk. Um, so um, I usually do just one mid-treatment scope exam to assess response. And if it looks like things are heading in the right direction, I don't scope again until follow-up. Um, so I do the just two scope exams, if I, if that suffices. Um, and, um, you know, we have a lot of precautions built into the department. So now actually they're testing all patients before they start treatment um, with a nasal swab RNA test. Um, but we, for other disease sites, not head and neck, there was sort of a push towards hypofractionation in settings where hypofractionation was considered to be an acceptable proven alternative. In um, particularly the head and neck, um, hypofractionation increases your risk for late toxicity. So we basically kept standard fractionation for most cases. For some skin cases, I had a few skin cases, um, um, just simple post-op um, temple that I would hypofractionate. Um, but for your standard head and neck carcinomas, I stuck with two grade perfection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think at my center too, we, we didn't change our regimens. Our, our patient volume also stayed the same because these were patients that needed treatment. So we, we didn't really defer any treatments. Our actually, our volumes increased because the head and neck surgeons stopped operating for a while because there's risk associated with um, the head and neck surgery um, case case rates. I don't, there's all these case reports from um, particularly there was like a, I think a base of skull case where every single person in the operating room contracted COVID. Um, so the skull base surgeons and the head and neck surgeons, um, if there was an equally um, sort of effective chemo radiation option would send them our way. So I had 20 patients on treatment <laughs> in April and May, <laughs> which wow. is probably not a lot. I don't know. In the Philippines, you guys may have a lot of patients all the time, but my usual caseload is around like, you know, 14 or something and to have 20 patients on treatment in the middle of all that <laughs> was kind of crazy. Wow. Uh, well, um, Dr. Keese, uh, oh, um, Oh, okay, one more question. This may be relevant. Um, how about treatment interruption for head and neck cases due to COVID? Um, would you- So we had, like I had up? an acephalaryx patient who got COVID. Um, he got it right in between cycle one and two of induction. So um, we ended up just taking a break uh, for a couple weeks in between cycles of induction. And, um, his um, blood counts and everything um, had recouped and his um, recovery from COVID was complete. Um, so he never required intubation or any, um, he wasn't on home oxygen or anything. So he basically got a regular three cycles of induction after all, and then went on to chemo radiation. And we didn't end up having to treat him while he was positive. We now have a room at a LINAC that is capable of treating patients while they're positive. So the, there's negative pressure and there's a HEPA filter with, for the air recycling. So if he were you know, to have tested positive mid-treatment and was as, um, with the, as minor of a course or COVID that he'd had, I would have just continued treatment with him on that machine. Um, I think it's a balance, you know, especially if the patient is has a serious case of COVID, which is likely 
in settings with chemotherapy, um, then a treatment break may be warranted. But the risk of that um, taking a treatment break is higher in high grade tumors and in the later, the latter part of the treatment course. So, you know, if someone were to contract COVID on like week five or six of a seven week course of chemo radiation, that'd be a tricky scenario because then if you take two weeks off, you know, what is the value of adding one more dose of chemo and one more week of radiation after a three week break, you know, with all of the potential repair? It's very, tricky. Um, but I would say try to get as much dose in without a break as you can um, if the patient happens to be diagnosed. We had a couple of patients who were diagnosed on week one or two, and we um, basically tacked on a little extra dose. So we kind of ignored that first week and, and just um, went a little bit higher on the final dose. Not to 80, but like, you know. <laughs> That was a breast case, actually. So, you know, those doses are so low. <laughs> Great. Well, Dr. Keese, thank you so much for your time. We really enjoyed uh, spending this uh, session with you. Uh, it was very valuable for education. I think the Philippine residents really appreciated your staying up late um, on a weekday to help give this. But um, we want to thank you. We hope we'll see you again. And I uh, hope that everyone in the Philippines has a good day today. Have a great day, everyone. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank great. you.